You are listening to True Crime Twins, a true crime podcast hosted by Chloe and Melina Cantor. True Crime Twins is distributed by Glassbox Media and is part of the Crawlspace Media family. Welcome back to True Crime Twins, where we use our academic and occupational backgrounds in criminology and medicine to bring you crime stories each week. I'm Chloe. And I'm Melina. Thank you so much for joining us again this week for more true crime. This week's crime story is the disappearance and presumed murder of Connecticut mother Jennifer Farber Dulos. The 50 year old mother of five, including two sets of twins and one baby girl, was last seen dropping her children off at school on May 24, 2019. Jennifer was recently separated from her husband, Fotis Doulos, a Greek national who was working in the United States as a real estate developer. The two had a very contentious marriage, during which Jennifer stayed home to take care of the children. The two had both attended Brown University and had later gone on to both get their master's degree. Jennifer had earned an MFA in writing from NYU the Tisch School, while Fotis had gotten his master's degree in business finance field. While Jennifer was home with the children, she maintained a parenting blog and was also a writer for Patch.com, where she covered the Avon, Connecticut area. They lived in Farmington, Connecticut, which is a very affluent area in central Connecticut. Fotis had built their 13,000 square foot mansion. By all appearances, everything was great, but unfortunately, she had been entrenched in a very emotionally abusive and terrifying marriage dynamic in which she was being heavily controlled by her husband and he was using the children as a tool to control her. He was emotionally abusive to the children. According to Jennifer in court documents, he was obsessed with water skiing and was forcing the children to water ski with him in hopes that they would become water ski prodigies, which she saw as somewhat baseless and a little bit delusional. I don't think, in her opinion, the children showed any particular liking or promise towards the sport to become professional in any way. But this was Fotis's focus, and he was relentless and almost like a drill sergeant in forcing them to do this activity that they had little to no interest in. He had also apparently had threatened to kidnap the children during the divorce process and had told Jennifer that he had purchased a gun. The divorce proceedings were initiated after Jennifer had discovered in 2017 that Fotis was having an affair. What's interesting about Fotis is that when he met Jennifer and they really started getting serious, he was ending a marriage already. He was already married. So then he kind of repeats the dynamic again where he gets bored of Jennifer or she stops, you know, being under his spell. So he gets very drawn to this Michelle Turconis, who, like him, loves water skiing. It just seems like they have a lot in common. And one of the worst things, besides the fear and intimidation that Fotis did to Jennifer, was basically he was just like, here's how this is going to go. Michelle and her daughter are going to move into our house, and we are going to be together. But you are going to take care of our children, and it's all going to be fine. That was the last straw for Jennifer because she was just like, I can't live like this. Like, this is just humiliating and beneath me. So she took the five kids, moved to New Canaan, which is about two hours away from Farmington. She just split and he actually called the cops because he was concerned about them. But in reality, she rescued herself and her kids from them in a scenario that a lot of people are unfortunately familiar with, which is when you have to just sort of split to save yourself from an abusive relationship. Things looked really good on the surface with Jennifer and Fotis at the beginning, especially because both of them were like striking. People described both of them as just very, very attractive. They're both tall, brown hair, brown eyes, good bone structure. Jennifer came from a very wealthy family from New York City. She basically was the kind of rich where she probably wouldn't have had to work ever and she could have supported herself and her five kids very easily 
even in a place like New Canaan, which is just crazy wealthy. And I think that Fotis sort of felt emasculated, which I literally, if anybody knows me, I hate that expression. I just think it shouldn't even exist. But I think that's how he felt, especially because Jennifer's parents who were trying to be supportive and generous, loaned him money to make the Forey Group, which is his house development group. They basically bankrolled the project. So then I think he felt indebted to them and in turn resentful of Jennifer. Gloria was a banker and Hilliard was a philanthropist. He even has a building at a local school in Brooklyn named after him because he was such a generous benefactor. She grew up with an older sister, Melissa, and her aunt is actually Liz Claiborne, who founded the fashion company Liz Claiborne. The very wealthy Farber family had loaned Fotis Dulos upwards of $1.7 million to bankroll his housing developments. Fotis Dulos was born in Turkey and grew up in Athens, Greece, and moved to the United States in 1986. Like Jennifer, he attended Brown University and then later went to Columbia for his MBA. His first wife was Hillary Aldama, who also went to Brown. The marriage lasted for four years, and they were divorced in 2004. That's when he founded the Four Group. As Molina said, he was fresh out of his divorce when he began pursuing Jennifer Farber, later Jennifer Dulos. The two actually started emailing while he was still with his first wife, Hillary. Just a month after Dulos got divorced, he married Jennifer Farber in Manhattan. Their children are Petros, Theodore, Constantine, Christiane, and Cleopatra Dulos. Since the disappearance of Jennifer, the children have been in the custody of Jennifer's mother, Gloria Farber. On the morning of May 24th, 2019, Jennifer dropped off her five kids at their school in New Canaan, which was pretty close to her house. That was around 8 a.m., and then she was seen on a neighbor's surveillance camera driving by them towards her house at 8.05. By the time Jennifer's employee, Lauren Almeida, got to the house at around 1130, she saw that Jennifer was not there, but her Range Rover was there. She thought this was weird because she knew Jennifer had an appointment in New York City that day, and she was planning on taking the Range Rover, but the Suburban was missing. She noticed that she had bought recently a huge pack of paper towels. And they were basically all gone, which she found extremely suspicious. Jennifer Suburban left her house at 10.25 a.m. So basically, she was seen near her house arriving home at 8.05, and that car left the home about two, two and a half hours later. It is believed that Jennifer's body was in that car and that she was ambushed in her own garage upon arriving home and that the killer cleaned up after themselves, put her in her own car and drove to where the car would be found in Waveney Park, which was a few miles away. Later on, it was revealed that an unidentified person riding a bicycle was seen in the area at the same time because cameras, they didn't really seem to catch a killer's vehicle in the immediate vicinity of Jennifer's home. So it looks like the killer rode a bicycle, which happens to be a sort of rare French bicycle that could be identified after a little bit of investigation. And presumably the killer put the bicycle and Jennifer's body in the Suburban, took all of that back to Waveney Park, where his truck, well, his employer's truck, it turned out, was waiting. He transported the bike and Jennifer's body into that truck, left the Suburban, and then drove back up to Farmington. And it's unknown where Jennifer's body is to this day. Despite Jennifer's whereabouts being unknown to this day, law enforcement were pretty certain that she was murdered and even charged her estranged husband, Photos Dulos, with murder in her death based on the amount of blood that was found in her garage where Jennifer was purportedly ambushed after Photos Dulos lay in wait for her to return after dropping off their five children. This crime was meticulously planned by Photos. Clearly, he was successful in concealing Jennifer's body up to this point as it still hasn't been located. He also took measures such as leaving his cell phone at home, taking his bicycle so that there would be no license plates to be read. He even had his girlfriend, Michelle Traconis, and his friend, Kent Mowinney, 
at his home where his phone was as an alibi for him. Later on, Fotis and Michelle were captured by many surveillance cameras driving down a main highway, disposing of trash in various public trash bins. Their license plate had been altered in an effort to conceal their identities, which clearly did not work as both were identifiable in this camera. When Michelle Traconis was brought in for questioning, she claimed that she had no knowledge of any crime against Jennifer Dulos and that she did not know what they were disposing of and that she eventually stated that she trusted the wrong person when she decided to trust Fotis Dulos and that she was acting innocently and with naivete. She was doing as he said. She trusted him enough to not press for further details and that if she knew what had happened to Jennifer, she would not have helped him. Since her incarceration, she has fought successfully for many liberties, including leaving the country to visit her father. Fotis eventually posted bail and then later died by suicide when he poisoned himself with carbon monoxide in his own garage. He was declared brain dead and put in a hyperbaric chamber. Doctors ultimately could not save his life and he was pronounced dead. And now, a quick word from our sponsors. Melina, when I had my daughter, I was 24 years old. So when I started even thinking about having kids, I was 23 years old. I was on birth control since I was 16. I got off of it for a week and my daughter Ava was conceived. Easy peasy. That's the case when you're 23. Now, I'm about to be 28 years old. I might want more kids someday, and it turns out that your fertility situation can change rapidly the closer you get to 30, and then even more so after you turn 30. And once you turn 35, your pregnancy is considered a geriatric pregnancy. These are all things that I never had to think about at age 23, but now I need to consider now at 28. This is where amazing companies like Modern Fertility come in. They are able, from just a few drops of blood, to tell you your fertility situation to help you prepare for your future and your family. The traditional guidance with fertility has been just wait and see. But now we have tools to help us plan for and track everything in our lives, wellness, finances, careers, school. So why is fertility still a wait and see? That's why Modern Fertility was created. It's an easy and affordable way to test your fertility hormones at home with a simple finger prick. Mail it in with a prepaid label, and you'll get your personalized results within 10 days. This helps you get insight into your hormone levels, your ovarian reserve, aka how many eggs you have compared to other women your age, and other important fertility factors. The results go deep into what every hormone means, and you can also download the results to review with your doctor for the next steps. Traditional testing can cost over $1,000, but Modern Fertility gets you the same info at a fraction of the price. Also, if you have an HSA or FSA, you can put those dollars toward modern fertility. If you want kids today or maybe one day in the future, clinically sound info about your body can help you make the decision that's right for you. Right now, Modern Fertility is offering our listeners $30 off for the test when you go to modernfertility.com slash tctwins30. That means your test will cost $169 instead of the hundreds or thousands it could cost at a doctor's office. Get $30 off your fertility test when you go to modernfertility.com slash tctwins30. Again, that's modernfertility.com slash tctwins30 for $30 off your fertility test. Thanks for listening to our sponsors. Now back to the show. Melina, can you tell me a little bit about the shrine or the memorial to Jennifer Dulos that's in Farmington and the significance of it? Who has contributed to it? Who has done just the opposite? What kind of messages are on there? So with all of this stuff about Jennifer and Fotis in the news, His community, which once embraced him, became repelled by him and everything he stood for because it was pretty clear that he was responsible for the disappearance. 
So people started making this shrine at the beginning of where their street starts for Jennifer with photos and messages. And one time Fotis actually got in trouble because he was caught removing things from the memorial because he said that they were like bullying to him. But I don't know. It's freedom of speech, freedom of press. Maybe it made him uncomfortable. And he felt like people were slandering him, but it didn't give him the right to try to remove it. But I do recall that shortly after he died, because I was following this very, very closely. And before it was deleted off of the internet, I saw a live snippet of basically, I don't know if it was a drone or a helicopter over Fotis' house, but you could literally see his lifeless body getting CPR performed on it by paramedics, like legit doing hard compressions, hard compressions. And I was just like, oh my God. But yeah, I don't think you could find that anymore. When I saw that, I was, it shocked me. I don't know why I didn't see it coming. I think that I thought that he was too into himself to ever do that. But I think that he was terrified of going to prison. Like (laughs) he would not have done well in there. I think that's obvious. And he knew that he was never going to be looked at the same. He knew that he was never going to get his kids back. He knew he couldn't portray the image that he wanted to portray anymore. So that's why he did it. And it was actually... Just before he was supposed to appear in court, he didn't show up. And then that's when he was discovered lifeless in his car in the enclosed garage. And he had photos of his kids with him and a suicide note that continued to declare that he was innocent, that he had nothing to do with this. And that he, if you are reading this, I am no more. When I saw that, I was like, oh, yikes. Gross. Anyway, basically his lawyer, Norm Pattis, after this, he was like, yeah, the the bloody clothes of Jennifer's and all the stuff that they were throwing away on Albany Ave that was just left there like that somebody was framing him or something like that it was just nuts but after he died I actually drove by his street Jefferson Crossing and there was a huge sign on the shrine that said thank you CSP and CO which means thank you Connecticut State Police and carbon monoxide which is pretty savage it's like saying thank you carbon monoxide for killing him The unraveling of a marriage, which can include, and in this situation did include, contentious custody battles, can be a precipitator in violent criminals, in lashing out against their former loved ones. Custody battles in particular have been cited as a significant motivator in family violence. Jennifer had requested emergency orders of custody several times. The first time they were given temporary joint custody until the end of the proceedings. When she did it the second time, the judge had determined that Fotis had violated numerous orders placed by the court and Jennifer was awarded sole physical custody of the children. Fotis was given supervised visitation and monitored phone calls. And I think when someone who hasn't been in a co-parenting situation or hasn't seen one firsthand, those words seem rather insignificant. But For a parent who previously had sole or shared legal and physical custody of a child to then only be permitted to see their children in a supervised setting to ensure that they don't misbehave, that is a terrible reflection of their past conduct and what someone in an official capacity deems them capable of. The fact that the phone calls even had to be monitored is pretty intense and shows that Jennifer was able to present evidence that Fotis was saying damaging and harmful things to the children, that he wasn't someone that could be trusted with the children. And in the end, it was the children that he betrayed the most. They say, don't pity the dead, pity the living. Look what he did to these children. He left them as orphans with no answers about where their mother is. I think it's clear to most just based on his whereabouts that day the CCTV that caught him disposing of evidence. And I believe there was forensic evidence belonging to him in the garage and in the sink when he was cleaning up. It's pretty clear that he's the one that's responsible. And to his grave, he still couldn't accept it, even for the sake of those poor children who know that their mother is out there, disposed of in a way that is undignified and disrespectful. Because no matter how she was disposed of, It is not how she would have wanted. She was extinguished from this earth, violently murdered, and then thrown away for her children to never have a place to visit, to remember. Fotis harmed those children 
more than he harmed anybody else, in my opinion. And I know that's kind of crazy to say because he murdered Jennifer and that is the most vile and horrific thing that someone can do to another or among the most vile and horrific things that someone can do to another. But he just gave his children a life sentence of longing and yearning and fear and a lack of closure. He could have given that to them after what he had done how horribly he sinned against humanity and against his own family. He was about to die. He could have rectified that. He could have somehow made it tolerable for those children to be able to at least accept what happened because to not have any basis for acceptance, how could they possibly move on from this? My heart breaks for those children. Before Chloe mentioned that one of Fotis's lawyers, Kent Mawini, was at his home with Michelle that morning of the disappearance. It was found that he, too, abused women, so it seemed like they had some stuff in common. Kent had been charged with raping his wife, and his wife was convinced that Fotis and him were planning on basically terminating each other's wives because apparently Fotis was trying to get Kent's wife alone to talk or like try to help resolve things. And she just got like a really bad feeling and was just like, "Uh uh-uh. But then she thought about it and she was like, oh my God, they probably had this kind of pact. And then it was discovered that there was basically a dug empty grave with bags of lye in it on some golf course that Kent belonged to. So people think that that may have been meant for Jennifer or for his wife. But then once it was discovered, I think they kind of ditched that idea. But it's possible that that's how Jennifer was, in fact, disposed of. I used to think that Jennifer was dumped somewhere near her house in New Canaan. But because of the blood that was found on the passenger side of the truck that Fotis thought he was being very clever by borrowing his employee's truck and then insisting that he switch out the seats. But that employee saved those seats. Thank goodness. And it was basically saturated in Jennifer's blood on the passenger side. So that tells me that he transported her body in that truck. So somewhere between New Canaan and Farmington, he probably had a dump site already, like a pre-dug grave and whatever else he needed. And he just dropped her there and then boom, all set. His problem is gone. But he didn't get away with it that easy. Everybody knew it was him. It was obvious. He lost control over her. But in reality... I think he imagined the sense of control over her. He really never had any control over her because she never really needed him. And I think that he couldn't stand that. With Michelle, this was somebody who was much younger and she had a young child and she needed somebody like him. But Jennifer never needed him. And that must have just driven him crazy. Kent and Michelle are both free, so to speak. They have upcoming hearings, but they are not in jail. I think they both have monitors, like ankle monitors, and they have some restrictions, but can do what they want. They can watch movies. They can cook. They can spend time with their loved ones. They can probably do fancy things because they have those circles that they might still be included in. I hope they're not, but I do believe that at least one of them I think both of them know exactly where Jennifer is, and I think that they are going to hell for not telling us where she is, because the source of all of this, he's gone. So what the hell is the point of not coming forward now? It would probably make their problems go away if one of them just said where she is, or if they sent an anonymous message or a tip or anything. But how could they not know where she was? They were in on the plan. They were his alibi. They even made like an alibi timeline of what to tell the police that they were doing, which was all a lie. I know that they know where she is. And like I said, they can go straight to hell for not giving her family that closure. With the amount of blood that police uncovered at the garage at Jennifer's house, it basically told them that she died or was close to death in the garage before being transported out because of the amount of blood. So I I feel like there must have been at least a liter. And even after all of that cleaning that Fotis must have done with all of the paper towels, and it doesn't take that long to kill somebody, especially if he did it in a very violent way, like a beating or with a knife or even with a gun. I think he had a gun, but we don't know how she died. We just know that she lost blood and she lost a lot of it. And despite Fotis's best efforts, there was blood found all over the garage, on the walls of the cars, and 
it was just a brutal scene. And that just tells me how enraged he was at her. And something that gives me nightmares is thinking about Jennifer driving into her garage with this false sense of security, walking out of her car. Boom. There he is. Like literally the object of her worst nightmares. There he is. She's cornered. She's screwed. I can't imagine how absolutely terrified she was. She probably saw him and she knew that this was it. The kids were gone. The nanny wasn't there. It was somebody that knew her routine clearly. To show up unannounced when he's not supposed to be anywhere near her without the court's say and without supervision, he just showed up unannounced all the way from Farmington, which is a considerable drive. He must have left really early to get there at 8.05 or whatever time it was that she got back. She knew. Jennifer will not be forgotten anytime soon, and her legacy stands in the state of Connecticut. After her murder and the murder of another Connecticut wife who was killed by her husband named Jennifer Magnano, Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont signed a law called Jennifer's Law, named after both women named Jennifer. The law expanded Connecticut's definition of domestic violence to include the concept of coercive control which had previously not been considered a violation of law, despite how powerful and how harmful it is. Examples of coercive control behaviors that are now identified by the law include manipulative control over a person's activities, stalking, including over the internet, isolating a person from their family, friends, and other supports, and denying a person resources that are needed for independence and quality of life. This law also makes coercive control a matter of consideration for restraining orders in the state of Connecticut, which is huge because before this, so many victims who had been encountering these coercive control patterns, which typically lead in behaviors even more harmful and dangerous, were being completely invalidated and discarded by the government when these victims are just asking for protection simply because the law at the time as it was written did not include the ways that they were being victimized. By all accounts, Jennifer Dulos was a wonderful mother, friend, and anyone can look up her writings online and see that she was a phenomenal, evocative writer. She wrote an article back in 2012 about her daughter Christiane, who was three years old at the time. There's a movie called Waitress, where the main character has a dreadful husband and starts an affair with her married OBGYN and is torn and unsure about having a baby and these men and her life in general. But once they place her newborn daughter in her arms, everything else melts away and there is absolute foreground clarity. This baby is love, is life, is it. And she leaves the husband and doctor and starts her own bakery called Lulu's, her daughter's name, and grows happier and happier each day, but for her daughter's existence. Christiane has been this ongoing miracle for me. The second they placed her in my arms, I just wept uncontrollably. I was that taken aback. Every day she does something thoughtful, something wonderful, something meaningful to me. Just taking her in, watching her breathe, her back going up and down as she sleeps, gives me oxygen. She has amplified my entire existence, and I am forever grateful. If you don't feel safe at home, please call 800-799-SAFE. You can also visit thehotline.org. Remember to clear your browser history after visiting the website. At any point during your time on thehotline.org, you can press the escape key on your keyboard twice to leave the website immediately.